spend in three weeks actually on Acts 2.38, very difficult passage. But uh, Acts 2.38, even though I think we've pretty well uh, dealt with explaining it, um, it raised a lot more questions because we were comparing Acts 2.38 to other passages and it led to a number of questions that were good questions and rightfully so they were asked. So I thought it would be good uh, to look at this paper that uh, we looked at this years ago. In fact, uh, pardon? Okay. Uh, you guys helped me with this. Uh, had, I had written a paper that looked kind of like it and then through the interaction with the Bible study, I was able to uh, make it even better. Uh, at least I think it's, it's better. So. But it's been a while, and y'all probably slept since then, and probably there's a few things that we need to be reminded of. But I think to, to, to leave Acts 2.38 with all those other questions hanging isn't good, so hopefully this will answer a lot of questions uh, this morning. So if you'll... Uh, Look at the side of the page, it's page 10. The back of the page is page 11. So look at page 10 with the diagram uh, or the chart at the top. Now you notice on the chart at the top, there are four groups of people that are in the left-hand column. Uh, the 11 disciples, the Jews, the Samaritans, and the Gentiles. And we're going to read through these passages and I want you to see as the chart, just glance at the chart, different things happened to each of these different categories of people. They weren't, they didn't all experience the same thing in the book of Acts in the same way or in the same sequence. Boy, that's troubling uh, for people that don't understand uh, what's going on. It's led to all kinds of doctrinal confusion and personal uh, confusion and uh, many people are not saved as a result of the confusion of uh, their understanding from the book of Acts. So what I want to do, I want to read through the passages about each group and, and, and point out on the chart what happened to each group. And then we'll read through the comments underneath the uh, chart. So let's start with the first group, the 11 disciples. If you would, turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. All right. Now in Acts chapter 1, Jesus is still on the earth. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus goes back up to heaven. He ascends to heaven. But before he ascends, here's what happens uh, in verse 4. Being assembled together with them, that's the uh, 11 disciples, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days uh, from now. So ten days later, and I should have this passage in your uh, chart, you turn over to chapter 2, I want to, I want to read verses 1 through 6, chapter 2. Uh, we'll read verses 1 through 6. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a, of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other, other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There were, dwelling in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. 
And when this sound occurred and the multitude came together, they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own uh, language. Okay, the most important thing here is in verse 4. They were all filled with the uh, Holy Spirit. So if you look at your chart, the first, uh, the next column over says the disciples had believed and were regenerated. What's regenerated mean? Born again. Huh? Born again. Yeah, born again. Generate means life, and re, life means again. Regenerated, life again. Born the first time physically, regenerated. So I'm using the word regenerated in this chart to say that's when they were born again. When were the disciples born again? Before or after what we just read? Good answer. This is uh, 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead. The disciples were saved, you know, way back. Before Jesus died. So uh, they'd been saved for some time. So they'd already believed and been regenerated. How about baptized? Were they baptized before or after this? Sure, they were baptized way before uh, this event in Acts. So you notice the next column, they were told to wait, and then the day came that they were indwelt, and when they were indwelt, they spoke in tongues. Right? So what one word summarizes what they had to do to receive the Holy Spirit? Wait. Wait. They had to wait. That was, that was it. They just had to wait. And uh, from chapter 1 to chapter 2, they waited uh, 10 days uh, to receive the Holy Spirit. All right, now let's turn over to uh, Acts chapter 2. Oh, was that the 50th day? Yeah, Pentecost means 50. 50th day from Pas Passover. Yeah. The Bible doesn't describe they were baptized after they believed, did they? No, there's no specific passage. We just know that they were. They were baptizing other people, so they themselves had to have been baptized. Probably, uh, some of them were baptized by John the Baptist. And I guess we're to assume that even Judas was baptized. That'd be a good assumption. I can't imagine that he wouldn't have been. Would Judas say? Is there such a thing as a, uns a person getting baptized who's not saved? Yes. Yeah, there was even with Judas. All right, let's turn over to chapter 2, and here we've got the Jews. The, the, this is the passage we've been looking at. Let me read it uh, again, starting in verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added uh, to them. Look on your chart. These Jews believed and were regenerated. Now, you should know, where, where, what verse did this happen? 37. 37. If you've been here for the last three weeks, you should know right away. Well, that happened in verse 37 when they were cut to the heart. Okay. The next column says they were to repent, and they did repent. 
And the next column said they were to be baptized. And when they were baptized, they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, because that's what Peter had said. Repent and be baptized, and you'll receive uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Pretty, pretty clear? Let's turn to the Samaritans. We haven't looked at this passage, but let's turn over to chapter 8. I guess I ought to show you in verse 5. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. So that'll tell us who, where he is and who he's talking to. Now verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed and he was baptized. He continued with Philip, and it was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So look at your uh, chart. They believed and were regenerated. Can you find the verse where they believed? Twelve. Twelve. Look at twelve. They believed Philip as he preached things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Of course, that would have been, if you're talking about the name of the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ, what's the most important thing he would have preached? Eternal life. Eternal life. Believe in Jesus for eternal life. So they believed in verse 12. They believed what Philip preached. Therefore, they. God saw their faith and they were regenerated. Okay, notice uh, in the third column they were baptized. We read that. Uh, that was also in verse 12. At the end of verse 12, both men and women were baptized. All right, then uh, Peter and John come from Jerusalem to pray for them. Uh, let's see, what verse was that? 15? Yeah, 14 and 15. They sent Peter and John to them who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Then the last column, Peter and John lay hands on them and there in uh, dwelt, verse 17. Then they laid hands on them and they received uh, the Holy Spirit. Now I have tongues question mark here. Uh, this this really is what I think is going on in verse 18. So look with me at verse 18. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay Hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now all this with Simon and why he said that, that's a whole other issue. But what do you think Simon saw? That's my question. When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. And the clue is in uh, what I already put on the chart. What could, what could he have seen? Speaking in tongues, yeah. A miracle that yeah. he wanted to receive. Yeah. I can't imagine what else it would be except that they spoke in tongues. Simon saw something visible and outward that made him say, I want to have this power. 
And I, that's why I put times there, but I put a question mark after it because, you know, I can't prove that, but that's what I think. It's the only thing that makes sense to me uh, in light of what we're going to see, what we've already seen. Uh, what have we already seen about tongues? Who? Who spoke in tongues that we already saw? Disciples. Disciples. And uh, we're going to talk about that as we go on. Why were these people speaking in tongues in Acts 2? Why did they speak in tongues? Probably uh, spoke in tongues in Acts 8. And then we're going to see they did they spoke in tongues in Acts 10 as well. Okay, so... Uh, Simon was a Samaritan. Yeah, he was one of the Samaritans. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, somebody have a... I'm sure I'm raising lots of questions. That's okay. Um, that's why I just want to see that what happens and then try to explain why these things happen the way they did. Okay, the fourth group are the Gentiles. If you turn over to Acts 10... We've read this in previous weeks, but today I think it'll um, make even more sense in light of this chart. Okay, uh, in the context, Peter is speaking to a group of Gentiles. Verse 43, he says, To him, Jesus, all the prophets witness that through his name, Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. Who would they be? Jews. The Jews. Because when Peter went, the Caesarea, other Jews went with him. Okay. They were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So look at your chart. They believed. They were regenerated. They were indwelt. And they spoke in tongues. Why do I have all of those in the same box? It happened at the same time. All those things happened instantly. The moment they believed, they were regenerated. Now, let's make sure we're on the same page. Is that true? What, when were you regenerated? Okay. And then we just read that in, the, in that same moment, they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. But notice, uh, baptized came after that. After uh, they were indwelt uh, by the Holy Spirit. <coughs> okay. If you look at the chart, you see lots of inconsistencies, don't you? They're not the same. I mean, all, all four of them are unique and different from the other. There's no pattern. There's no pattern. It's just uh, very inconsistent, if I could use that word. So uh, that leads to the... Underneath there, I wrote a very brief paragraph. As you study the chart above, the obvious questions are, what's going on here in the book of Acts? Why are all these different... Why are there different conditions for each uh, group? And uh, so what I'm going to do is gonna, I'm going to read through this paper uh, one paragraph at a time and then stop and see if you have any questions about that paragraph uh, as we go through it. The answer to those questions is found in understanding 
that the book of Acts is a transitional book in which we see God moving to build his newly founded church in a new church age, which, we, which began on the day of Pentecost as recorded in Acts 2. But in doing so, he had to solve some big problems concerning the Jews. Okay, any questions about the first paragraph? Well, what's the problem with the Jews? Well, that, that, that's what lies ahead, so good question. Any question about the church beginning on the day of Pentecost? Okay. So let's go to the next paragraph. One problem was that God was dealing with the generation of Jews that had called for the crucifixion of Christ. That's why Peter calls them a perverse generation, Acts 2.40. And why Paul said, wrath has come upon them to the uttermost, 1 Thessalonians 2.16. So what would God require of these Jews, not only to gain everlasting life, but also to gain fellowship with him and with other believers in the new family? Church. Yeah, you're answering the question. That's good. You're answering the question. Does anybody have a question about the problem that God was dealing with that I tried to uh, explain in that paragraph? We talked about it. In fact, even last week we talked about this problem, didn't we? Okay. So probably that's fresh in your mind. Okay, so let's go to the next paragraph. Another problem concerning the Jews was their relationship to the neighboring Samaritans, those of a different race and a different religion. As John wrote, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. John 4, 9. Yet, God's design was that Samaritans who believed in Jesus for everlasting life would be one body in Christ with believing Jews in the newfound church. So what could God do to convince these two groups that they are one in the eyes of God and to have fellowship with one another? So I've only raised the question. I didn't give the answer, but do you any question about what the problem was here? with the Samaritans and the Jews. Is that pretty straightforward? Okay, let's go to the next paragraph. Another problem concerning the Jews was their lack of a relationship to the Gentiles, non-Jews. This problem is illustrated by the words of shock that believing Jews spoke to Peter. You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. Acts 11, uh, 3. Uh, by the way, you should have your Bibles open. Let's look at that. I didn't read it earlier, but look at... Uh, let's, after what happens in Acts 10, let's read on in, in chapter 11. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. So do you pick up that there was a problem here? I mean, what did Peter come back and have to say? What good news did he think he was bringing? That the Gentiles had believed in Jesus. Yeah, what would you hope that the Jews would say? Yeah, Amen. Uh, oh wow, that's so, God is so loving. He even loves Gentiles. He wants to save non-Jews. Isn't that exciting? But what was their response? <laughs> they were mad. They, they just couldn't believe that Peter would go and eat with these Gentiles. So that 
I'm only trying to underscore this was this problem. The Gentiles, the Jews would have nothing to do with the Samaritans. They would have nothing to do, you know, fellowship wise with the Gentiles. I'm only underscoring these are big uh, problems. Three problems. What was the, tell me, tell me, what was the problem with the Jews themselves? They crucified Christ. They crucified Christ. What was the problem in relation to the Samaritans? No dealing with Samaritans. No dealing with Samaritans. What was the problem with the Gentiles? No Same thing. Same thing. Won't have anything to do with Gentiles. So I'm, I'm elaborating here. But what God, what's God trying to do? Bring unified yeah. salvation yeah. for everyone. Yeah. Save all of them and make them one. And what would it look, what look like for them to be one? I mean, based on what we've seen. Same for you, baptize the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but then what would it look like in action? Well, well, fellowship. Each other. Yeah, they, they, they love each other. And they think we're, we're, we're part of the same body of Christ. We're one in Christ. That mindset, that, that was so far away from the mindset of believing Jew, born again believing Jew, that didn't want to have anything to do with Samaritans and Gentiles. And God said, that's got to change. I've got to do something to wake up the Jews in terms of their attitude toward these Samaritans and these Gentiles. I'm just elaborating. Jesus had commanded the apostles, the disciples, to do that. He said, stay in Jerusalem, reach the Jews first, then go to Samaria, and then go to the Gentiles. So he had us one, two, three process to do this and establish in the church. They were just doing what he said to do. Were they first doing, did they have that mindset at first? No, not first. No. No, they didn't. I like didn't. No. That's why God was doing something dramatic here in the book of Acts to get their attention. All right. Ready to go on? Okay, I think we're in the... Uh... Yeah, let me read the last sentence of that second to last paragraph one more time. So what would God do to convince these two groups that they are one in the eyes of God and to have fellowship? with one another. Last paragraph. God dealt with each group in a specific and unique way to solve each of these problems. One of the tools God used was the gift of tongues, a supernatural sign from God to the Jews to prove that he was at work. As Paul writes, with men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to this people. And yet, for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. Let me read part of that again. With men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. Who are the this people? Jews. It wasn't strong, but you're right. It's the Jews. Um, this is a quotation, I believe, from Isaiah. Oh, I need to look that up. I should have put it in here. He's quoting from Isaiah, I think. Isaiah is speaking to the Jews. Uh, Tongues is for a sign to the Jews that God is at uh, work. Now, when it says tongues are for a sign not to those who believe but to unbelievers, need to think for a moment. What kind of unbelievers? Jewish. Jewish. Yeah. Jewish unbelievers. And uh, primarily that has in mind they don't believe in Jesus for eternal life. But a believer, a believing Jew could be an unbeliever about something else. What could a believing Jew not believe? Yes. I don't believe that the Samaritans could be saved and that we're supposed to be one of them. I don't believe that the Gentiles 
can be saved and that we're supposed to be one with them. So there's an underlying current here that, yes, tongues were for a sign to unbelievers, meaning they didn't believe in Jesus for eternal life. Unbelieving Jews who didn't believe in Jesus for eternal life. But it was also a sign to unbelieving believers who didn't believe that Jews and Samaritans could be part of the body of Christ. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? Hadn't they been told for help? Since Moses, that they were the special people, and they were having a hard time getting rid of that attitude. Yes, Gene, thing. that's right. And God never intended them for, to have an attitude about it. But they got it. But they got it, yes. That's the fleshly view of a, of a, of a spiritual blessing. God blessed them spiritually to be a light to all the nations. In you, all the nations shall be blessed. And you nailed it. Gene, in their self-centered fleshliness that they got prideful that they were the special chosen people of God and forgot their role. That we're supposed to be a light to the world. Thanks for underscoring that. We talked about that in uh, Lesson 4 through uh, Science Summer, right? I'll use it through man. It talks about how they, they thought they were uncommon. They thought they were common and uh, unclean. Yeah. And even Peter thought it until he had the vision. Yeah, thank you. It was a big problem, even with the apostles. Good point. Well, isn't that uh, that problem still prevalent uh, today in some areas? And what do you, uh, with the Jews, let's say, and Jews and Gentiles uh, getting along, let's say, in some areas. <clears throat> Yeah. Sure. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So God's still trying. He's still working. He got still got a job to do, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. I guess well, you could say that. Going on with this deal with Candace Owens and Sapiro and the other rabbis that are, you know, it's really been quite a week. Yeah, I guess you're you're aware of something. I, I don't know what you're talking about, but that's okay. But it's, it goes back to anti-Semitism. Okay. Well, yes, there. Yes, the it it cuts both ways. It's not just Jews' feelings toward others; it's others' feelings toward the Jews. Is that what you're saying? Well, there's uh, rabbis against. Rabbis against certain sectors. It, I, I tell you what, the more you read about the Jewish, uh, especially in Israel right now, there's so many fractions in, in Israel. Uh -huh. it just, it's a difficult situation. Yeah, it is. Okay, so this side of the paper is pretty much to lay out the problem. Okay, and I think. Maybe I've laid it out where I think it's pretty clear that their problems existed when it came to the Jews, Samaritans, and the Gentiles. Uh, the Jews and the Samaritans, the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews that had crucified Christ. And that chart is a picture of what God did to try to solve these problems. But I haven't explained how this was to work. You might already guess how it was going to work out or what God was doing. But on the other side, on page 11, I've tried to explain it. So if you turn over to page 11, now the chart is the same chart. I just wanted it visible on this side. Let me start at the top. Now, let's consider an explanation of the different conditions for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in each of the four different groups. First, notice that all of these groups were regenerated, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, born again, the moment they believed in Jesus for everlasting life. Also notice that all of these groups were baptized after <coughs> being regenerated. So look at the, the, the chart. 
in the second column, every one of those groups, I have belief, regenerated, belief, regenerated, belief, regenerated, belief, regenerated. And notice in the fourth column, every one of them were baptized after they believed and were regenerated. Okay? Make sense? Next paragraph. The eleven disciples in Acts 1 had to wait to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit because the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 7.39 Jesus was glorified when he ascended to heaven. Acts 1, 9-11 Ten days later on the day of Pentecost the disciples having waited, were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 1 to 4. None of the other groups were told to wait to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Let me reread that last sentence. None of the other groups were told to wait to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Okay, question about that paragraph. All right, next paragraph. The Jews in Acts 2 were the specific generation of Jews who had crucified Christ, Acts 2.36. Because of this, they are called a perverse generation, Acts 2.40. Wrath has come upon them to the uttermost, 1 Thessalonians 2.16. These Jews were regenerated when they were cut to the heart, believed, in response to Peter's message about Jesus, Acts 2.36 and 37. Yet, because they had crucified Christ, God designed that these newly regenerated Jews had to repent and be baptized in order to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. None of the other groups were told to repent and be baptized to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to repeat that. None of the other groups were told to repent and be baptized to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Note. These Jews had to repent and be baptized to also receive forgiveness of sins. This was experiential fellowship with God forgiveness. They received positional everlasting life forgiveness the moment they believed. None of the other groups are told to repent and be baptized for forgiveness of sins. I'll repeat that sentence. None of the other groups are told to repent and be baptized for forgiveness of sins. Okay. Question about that paragraph. That's pretty much a summary of what we looked at for three weeks. So you may not have any questions. Next paragraph. The Samaritans in Acts 8 were regenerated by the Holy Spirit when they believed. Since Peter and John were the two primary leaders of the Jewish church in Jerusalem, their identification with the Samaritans through prayer and the laying on of hands demonstrated to Jews and Samaritans they, that they were now one body in Christ. None of the other groups had to meet these conditions of prayer and the laying on of hands to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to repeat that sentence. None of the other groups had to meet these conditions of prayer and the laying on of hands to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. It is possible, if not likely, that the Samaritans spoke in tongues when they were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, as it is likely the tongues is what Simon saw. Tongues were assigned to the skeptical Jews that God was at work in these Samaritans. Question about that paragraph. Does it make sense? Okay, last paragraph. The Gentiles in Acts 10 believed in Jesus for everlasting life and the forgiveness of sins. And in that very moment, they were regenerated and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. These Gentiles did not have to meet any of the additional conditions that the other groups had to meet to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. 
The immediate indwelling of the Gentiles in Acts 10 is the pattern for the church age in which we live today, as confirmed in 1 Corinthians 6.19 and Romans 8.9. God gave the Gentiles in Acts 10 the gift of tongues as a sign to skeptical Jews that he was at work in saving the Gentiles and that believing Jews and believing Gentiles are one body in Christ. See Peter's report to the Jews in Acts 11, 15 to 18. The report of this to unbelieving Jews was a sign to them that God wanted it known that he was saving Gentiles in order to make the Jews jealous that they might believe in Jesus for eternal life. As Paul wrote concerning the Jews, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Romans 11, 11. Question about that paragraph. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know if that's good or bad. If you don't have a question, maybe that's good. If you don't have a question, maybe I've just overwhelmed you. So, does that make sense? never heard an explanation from anybody else anywhere under any circumstances that explains it to that degree. I think that's probably true of all of us who have heard this either today or for through the years. Yeah. So, I think it's extremely helpful. Would this be the mystery of the church being revealed to Paul talks about the peace of the one. The mystery of the church? Uh -huh. Mystery? The whole concept of, well, we're all in the Christ, the Samaritan Jews. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the church is a mystery, and I think, yes, I think this could be part of the mystery. There's a lot of um, ins and outs and angles about what the church is and why it came about and what God was doing. So yeah, I think that's probably true. This is part of it. It's not all of it. Okay, question? Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. So, last week I asked if we could be very precise and say what exactly are the Jews in Acts 2 repenting of? Can we do that? What would you say they're repenting of? Their hatred of Christ and the and the church, or the or hatred of Christ and his followers. All right. Thank you. Because uh, they they had to repent of that and. Part of their repentance was not just to turn from the bad works, but to do the good works. And uh, I think we read it. Um, they were baptized, and then they started fellowshipping with other with the believers. So the bad works that they're turning from are what? You said the hatred, but what would be some examples of the bad works that they're turning from? Ostentation of the other Jews that have been Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Jews, believers, even before, uh, even while Jesus was still alive, Jews that openly identified with Christ were ostracized by other Jews. In some cases, it was, uh, many cases, it was a financial, they could lose their job. They could not be allowed to buy or sell from other Jews. I put them, it's, it was a real, uh, you know, many... That's why many believers didn't openly identify with Christ because of the fear of the Jews and the treatment of the Jews. So it was more of a lifestyle that they were living, that Peter was saying, you have to stop living that. And <clears throat> yeah, and identify with the believers. If they didn't, there was such a thing to, uh, 
even while Jesus was alive, the secret believers, right? There were people that believed that they were secret about it. They didn't tell anybody because of the fear of the treatment from other Jews. Now Peter is saying, if you, if now if you, uh, it's, you've been cut to the heart, you believe, but if you want to have fellowship with God, you need to repent of your attitude towards these Christians. You need to identify with them. Which takes, which takes action, which is work. Yes. It's not, it's not all just happening. Hundred percent. That's important. That's, that needs to be settled. Yes. That it's, that it's, that they're, they're moving from some bad works to good works. Yes. And then it be identified in order for us to defend this. Yes. And say that repentance is not just a change of mind. Yes, thank you for underscoring that. And in Acts 2, I read it, I think I read down to where they, they start, they, uh, yeah, let me, let me read it again. Just to in, in my opinion, it doesn't suffice to say that the sin they're repenting of is crucifying Christ. Because you, That's all you've got to deal. Yeah, and the Romans did that, right? Like, no, they did it too. Literally, the Jews didn't have authority to kill anyone. So they didn't actually crucify him, the Romans did. No, I think what you're doing is, this is good. It wasn't just feeling sorry for what they did to Christ. And I did stop short. I should have read um, in Acts 2. I read 41 that says they were baptized. I should have read 42. In the second hour, I will. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and in prayers. So they did that with other believers. So they not only uh, were baptized, but they fellowshiped with other believers. And to do that was a courageous work in those days. Because we know that the persecution of the church continued on into Acts. So, good point, Josh. They, it wasn't just that they felt sorry for what they did to Jesus. They actively were involved in the good work of being a part of the church. The teaching, the fellowship, the breaking bread, and prayers. Identifying with other believers. Good point. Let's pray.